Despite the verdict, MacDonald still clung to his story. With funds dwindling, he hired a private investigator, the former head of the FBI in Los Angeles, Ted Gunderson. Finally, long after the trial, Gunderson persuaded Helena Stokely to come to Los Angeles. She told him, if you get me immunity, I'll drop a bombshell. Because that's all we're going to tell you for now. On the way from the airport, Helena seemed drugged and reticent. She was very, quite a bit held back. And she was very, kind of almost timid. Like she didn't know if she should talk to me or not. It was an encounter as bizarre as any in this story. The FBI man who'd been one of Hoover's favorites and the pathetic, addicted Helena together in a hotel room in Los Angeles. She was a street person. Look at me, evaluate me, decide whether or not she could trust me. She sized me up all day long. It was uh, kind of like a sparring match. After hours of persuasion, Helena began to talk. Yes, sir, that in fact that I have not been coerced. She said her conscience bothered her. Are you concerned about your personal safety? Mine, my family's. Merely about the Gunderson fact. typed out her statements and she signed them. Later, no, one of her interviews with Gunderson contact. was filmed. By who? Members of the cult. They said it was all right to go on television? No, sir. They told me to keep my mouth shut. She seemed genuinely frightened, wanting to confess, yet terrified of the consequences. And you still don't have immunity? No, sir. He says he offered her neither immunity nor money. It was understood right at the beginning. There were no threats or promises were made. Uh, and she was going to have to talk, it was going to be voluntarily. Is that true? Yes, it's true. In the end, she said she'd been present at the McDonald house, dazed on mescaline and heroin. She'd seen the killings through a veil of drugs. Greg Mitchell had killed Mrs. McDonald. Another woman was involved, as were two whites, and a black man in Sergeant Stripes. Maybe California just fueled Helena's fantasies. Gunderson drove her to see a psychologist who tested her. He pronounced her sane and highly intelligent. Yet only a few years before, a hospital in North Carolina found her paranoid and deluded. The only way to solve the mystery, Gunderson thought, was to take her back home to North Carolina. Fayetteville at a house on Hay Street. She described a cult she'd joined 13 years ago, its members in the military and their use of drugs. Uh, we did a lot of opium with the cult. I was using heroin myself, but with the cult, they used a lot of uh, opium and mescaline. I had access to drugs because I was dealing them myself to support my own habit. Late in 1969, she said her boyfriend, Greg Mitchell, and others had planned to approach Dr. McDonald, who was refusing to give methadone to drug users on Fort Bragg. We simply discussed the fact that he was giving us a hard time and that someone did have to have a talk with him. And they were just going to rough him up a little or something like that. And things got out of hand. She led Ted Gunderson back to Castle Drive. Gunderson was impressed. She seemed to know details of the inside of the house, even of Mrs. McDonald's jewelry box. She accurately described it, and she told me exactly where it was the night of the murders. However, there were inconsistencies. Some of the people she named couldn't possibly have been involved in the murders. On February 16, Helena says she phoned Mrs. McDonald, pretending to be a fellow student at an evening class she attended. The plan was to check her movements. Later, as classes ended, the group drove out to the University Extension School on Fort Bragg to see Mrs. McDonald. That evening, I was wearing a blonde wig as a joke that belonged to my roommate and a floppy hat. I had on a black skirt, and I'm not sure what type of blouse, and boots. 
it's tempting to dismiss Helena Stokely as a false witness. However, we set out to find others who might possibly corroborate her story. Amongst them, a teacher at the school who remembered the night of February 16 very clearly. She says she saw a group of people approach Mrs. MacDonald as she left class. A young man seemed to be threatening her. I heard him say to her, I think it will be all right if you just go along. If you just go along. If you something. just go along. And uh... as she responded, um, I dread to. And of course, I was just passing them and I made my way out the, uh, the back exit after hearing that. How did she seem? She seemed um, quite unsettled. She seemed quite unsettled. I had noticed the sad expression on her face as I was making my way down the uh, stairs. So she was evidently disturbed by what this person was she doing. Ap she appeared to be. The young man she identifies as Greg Mitchell. Watching were a black male and three women. One was wearing a brown jacket with a brown floppy brim hat. Another one was wearing a brown knot jacket with a beret. And the third woman was wearing um, a white floppy hat, a white vinyl jacket, and as I passed in front of her, making my way to the exit, I noticed that she was wearing white boots. And they were very clean boots. I noticed that because it had been raining for a very long time, and I thought, how did she keep those boots so clean? Just before midnight, Helena Stokely said she took some mescaline, then left for a Dunkin' Donuts restaurant on Bragg Boulevard. There, witnesses saw the group and watched them leave after 1 a.m. Before it started to rain heavily, a neighbor of the McDonald's claims he saw a young woman and two men carrying candles approaching the house. The TV was on, but it was off the air. Dr. McDonald was laying down on the couch. He apparently had been reading something because the book was turned upside down on him and his reading glasses were on the coffee table. Then someone went into the bedroom. Colette was laying there with one baby. And when it got out of hand, I just wanted to get out of there. Greg Mitchell was in the bedroom then. I walked out, went into the other bedroom, and there was another baby in there, and I backed up against a rocking horse, and it was broken. I noticed the spring was broken on it. She was careful to say that she never participated in actual killings. I just screamed, uh, acid is groovy, kill the pigs, hit him again. Then, she says, the phone rang. Someone asked for Dr. McDonald, and everybody started laughing and everything because we were all on drugs. We traced a man who claims he made the call. His name is Jimmy Fryer. He was a sometime alcoholic and had a troubled history in and out of the army. However, army records do confirm part of his story. The night of February 16, 1970, he was a patient at Womack Hospital on Fort Bragg. That night, he says, he left his ward without permission and got drunk in Fayetteville's red light district. Fryer's doctor was another Dr. McDonald, who, he says, used to treat him indulgently. Finding he had no money for a taxi, he staggered to a payphone, hoping his Dr. McDonald would somehow arrange to get him back to the hospital. It was after 2 a.m., and when I called the hospital, I asked for Dr. McDonald. I didn't specify the first name. I said, let me speak with Dr. McDonald. And uh, they told me he was not on call that night. He says in the end he was given the home number for Dr. McDonald, the wrong Dr. McDonald. He dialed it. The lady answered the phone. She was, uh, said hello and was laughing hysterically. Like, you know, she was drunk or could have been high or whatever. I don't know. Did she sound as though she was alone in the house? No, there, there was definitely people in the background. What kind of breakage. What kind of sounds could you hear? Like, uh, you know, someone if they fell over or something, knocked things over, things like that. There seems no way he could have known that Helena Stokely told the same story. I just started laughing, and they said, hang up the phone. So I hung up the phone. Then a voice, a male voice behind said, hang up the goddamn phone. Hang up the goddamn phone. Right, and they, all I know is the phone went dead. I don't know if it was snatched out of the wall or hung up or... That's, that's all I know. On Bragg Boulevard, very near the McDonald House, was an intersection. At 2.30 a.m. the night of the murders, Shirley Cole, an Air Force wife, says she saw a car parked off the road near the lights. 
coming up on the red light. I was stopping for the red light. Beside the road was this car, a 1964 Ford Mustang. What with color? Dark blue. Helena said she was in a blue Mustang that night. Well, there was two different cars. One was a blue Mustang, one was a yellow Plymouth. Mrs. Cole later identified a woman she saw standing beside the car as Helena Stokely. She had a dress, a dress on, high top boots, a white hat, broad brim, white hat, long hair. Around 4 a.m., Helena was seen by a neighbor coming home in a blue Mustang wearing her floppy hat and boots. At daybreak, a waitress at a Fort Bragg drive-in restaurant, who today is afraid to be named, noticed a woman emerging from a car. She held her hat to make sure she didn't lose her hat. And I noticed she had a floppy type hat on. And um, she said, did you know Mc Mc McDonald's family were killed and that he might die too? And I said, no. And um, she had on boots and they were smeared like with blood. This is white boots. White boots, sort of like off-white boots. She's adamant that what she saw on the woman's boots wasn't mud. It was um, red and smudgy outline of red. And this is, this is red and it's not, not brown, not no, the color of mud? No, not brown. Strictly red. Years later, Alina Stokely would claim her boyfriend, Greg Mitchell, had personally killed Mrs. McDonald. Soon after the killings, a man identified as Mitchell checked into a drug rehabilitation center on Hay Street. The man was in a terrible state. He really was, Chris. He needed help so badly. And he confessed that he had taken the lives of a woman and two children. And he wanted, to, he wanted God to forgive him, he wanted to be forgiven, and he wanted help. The center was expanding to a nearby farm. Some days later, Mitchell went out there. Mrs. Kennedy arrived to see him running away from the farmhouse deeply upset. We went into the first room and it was empty and we went into the second room and across the wall was where the person who had been there, Greg Mitchell, had written in blood, I killed McDonald's wife and children. It was in three lines across the wall. In blood? Mm -hmm. It was in blood. They, they found an animal in the backyard. I don't know what it was, but an animal had been killed and was in the backyard and evidently he had used the blood from that animal. In the years afterwards, Mitchell roamed the Carolinas, telling close friends about an incident long ago that troubled him greatly. It's a measure of the violence that surrounded the group that Mitchell's closest friend, a truck driver, is afraid to be identified even today. He said when he was in service that he was involved in something that was too horrible to talk about. He said, it's so horrible, he said, I have never even told Pat about this. This was his wife? Yeah. To his friends, Mitchell displayed what seemed like genuine distress. Because for years, something had bothered him really, really bad, and it really upset him. You could tell that Greg was a tortured human being. Mitchell described a strict army doctor who'd earned the hatred of addicts. He said, if the son of a bitch had only given us methadone, he said, we wouldn't have had to go through what all we did. Later, Mitchell said he was afraid of the FBI. He said he just had to get some money and he had to get out of it. He might even have to leave the country. And I said, well, Greg, don't worry about it. If you didn't do anything, you don't have anything to worry about. And Greg said, well, that's just it. I did it. I'm guilty. When Helena Stokely's confession was mentioned on TV, Mitchell was angry. He said there is a, a bitch out there if she don't keep her mouth shut. Uh, we're going to have to shut it for or something of that effect. Mitchell was interviewed by the CID and FBI, denied the allegations, and even passed a polygraph test. In private, however, he told a very different story. He said that they didn't mean to kill anybody. They had just went there to get even with McDonald's for getting them in some kind of trouble over some drug something about drugs. And uh, that uh, things went bad after they got on the inside. 
Greg Mitchell will now never testify in court. Drug and alcohol abuse, begun in Vietnam, killed him. Nor will we ever know if there was an awful truth behind the confused story of Helena Stokely. She'd gone to ground in Valhalla, on the edge of the mountains in South Carolina. Destroyed by drink and drugs, she was found dead in her tiny apartment. If he's guilty, MacDonald in one sense was lucky. Real life came to mimic his fantasy. He invented assailants who resembled real people, who then confessed to the crime. Unfortunately for MacDonald, neither he nor Helena Stokely were believed. You don't have to believe me. I'm just trying to keep an innocent man from being in prison. If the uh, FBI 